thank you for being here. We have four poets with us. They're standing in the wings and they're wondering how come the crowd is full and waiting for them. But I think when we have poets, we should not waste our time on prose. So I'm just going to very quickly say we have with us Jeet Tayal, Arundhati Subramaniam, Ruth Padale, and Ranjit Hoskote. Today, on the last day of the festival, I don't think they require individual introductions. They're all award winning. They all have multiple volumes to their names, but it would be safe to say that their poems have the rhythm of jazz and the beat of reality. All of them in their own way, write poetry and write of poets. Their muses range from how to be to how we are. They write of the arts, literature, history, and of course, our daily lives. From the hawk to grandparents, to Mary Eliz Mary's elephant, to Elizabeth Spinett, from our plural past to the penitent. I shall now leave it to the poets to take stage. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you, and I hope you're not melting from the heat. Um, so I'm, I'm the first. My dear colleagues thought they wanted me to be first, so I'm very happy to be first. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from this book on migration. I don't know if any of you were at the migration session, but I was completely overwhelmed by the um, film maker of A Thousand Miles and also the, um, the, the, the journalist who written a book about the migrations from Delhi during COVID. Um, so I'm gonna read a very short little poem, um, which is about migration, a migration up from Africa. The awful stuff that happened after 9-11 meant that Everybody, every country was, was controlling its borders much more carefully. And a new stamp on migrants' forms was created, L-O-C, lack of credibility. And this is the kind of thing that happened. It was a very cruel moment. And the cruelty of stages of migration has only gone in um, hops. <laughs> um, so I'm just looking for it. It's called Purple Ink. Just be it. Purple Ink. She has waited three years for this. Too ashamed to even half tell the young woman in spectacles tapping a purple barrow on a desk exactly what the soldiers did to her, each, each versatile in his turn. She gets wrong, date your mother was born, and sees a stamp, the color of desert night, descend on her file. So one of the things this book is about, one of the arguments of it is we are all from somewhere else. We were all migrants once. Migration created the world. We don't know how the first cell got here, but it came from either out of space or under the sea. And when it got here, it started to spread. Migration created history. It created um, every civilization. And so this is a plea really for the naturalness of migration and how strangers should all be honored. First cell. Born in a deep sea vent, synthesized by lightning in a reducing atmosphere, or carried here by meteorite, we are all from somewhere else. Algae, 
first self-replicating molecule on Earth, pulls carbon from organic substrate, performs the world's first magic, photosynthesis of air to oxygen, and creates copies of herself, uncountable as starlings flocking, or the pure gold bricks Sheba sent to Solomon by mule. Cell, in the air, on the rocks. Song, hoping to be heard in a heart cut open. Little blue-green, dreaming of pattern and form. Tiny horseman of apocalypse. Well, now some slightly more personal ones that um, are connected in some ways with water. And this poem is about an amazing photograph I saw by the American photographer, Steve McCurry. It was taken in a sandstorm in a desert in Rajasthan. And formally, I have tried to, to reverse it. So it starts with lines up there and then it carries on into them again. So it's a kind of hourglass. A prayer for rain in the desert of Rajasthan. They were singing a prayer for rain after a decade of drought. The sky went suddenly dark and I realized I had mislaid my heart. A pre-monsoon dust storm lit the ochre air and the women hazed with dust huddled under a tree. The wriggling branches stamped on the blowing sand, wild shape-shifting calligraphy above their rough scarlet head coverings, their long crimson robes blowing about in the flying air as if pregnant with it, protecting themselves from the spinning wind and stinging haze, their heads all bent in close together. You couldn't see their faces, just the bare tree lashing like the mast of a ship foundering on open sea in the desert of Rajasthan. I was lost somewhere in the middle of life. They were all bent in close to each other. You couldn't see their faces, protecting themselves from spinning wind as if pregnant with it, blowing about in the flowing air, just the bare tree, their long crimson head coverings above a rough scarlet calligraphy on the blowing sand. And the women lit the ochre air. The sky went suddenly dark. I had mislaid my heart after more than a decade of drought, and I realized they were singing a prayer for rain. Well, thank you. Okay, so some of this, these collections, they're both about psychology and about water. And water in this crisis of nature and environment that's upon us is often in the wrong place. It's too much water in lots of places and not enough in others. Um, but there's one goddess who is naturally belongs with water. And this is a memory of when I was about nine and not getting on with my dad. The day my father left me on the pavement in Oxford Street. On the horizon, I see green meadows and clear pools and the promise of something new, like the day my father left me on the pavement in Oxford Street because I kept him waiting. He was fed up. I had to learn to come back by myself, find my own way. Did he even know I had money to get home? The past is always inside us. The future is over the horizon, coming up from under or scampering over the surface of a luminous mirror freckled with weed, where the Nereids hide to come out at night to dance and maybe make mad the men waiting for them. Nymphs of the river, nymphs of the sea, the daughters of ocean, who at the end of the play will choose to go down to Hades with the bringer of fire. Nymphs of imagination, sleeping at the source of the Danube, nymphs of shimmer and sometimes deception in the free swirl out of the gender frame where you can be anyone, anyone you want, like the shape-shifting silky, again a male story, from the world you picture under the riptide, which might do for you altogether, 
a rogue wave you may never climb out of in your fear of the other with the sea in her hands and your fear of what lies beneath, where a woman can swim with her own story, flow with a current, create her own realm, like a song pulled out of the trees by Saraswati, goddess of knowledge, wisdom, and art, whom you may see with a sitar and white lotus, or alone with her many arms, representing the many possibilities of imagining, but always sitting by water, clear water. See where it takes you, being left on the pavement alone. Thank you. My colleagues think I should do one more, and I always do what they say. <laughs> um, these are new poems, and when you're starting new poems, you never know how they're going to, how you're going to feel about them, and how other people are going to feel about them. If water always finds its own level, how can the earth be curved? That's the title. If water always finds its own level, how can the earth be curved? Let's bring back the ballerina, the figure of innocence who stands for all of us somewhere in our souls, dancing the swan at the edge of the lake, gazing at where she, he came from, the element where we began and can never return, gazing at water hyacinths, choking good reeds, at a cloud of swamp mosquitoes breeding in the Vale of Health, where everything that disappeared from our life has got stuck in the pinch of the hourglass, the winter solstice furred up in frost, when water is in the wrong place, in your eyes, on your knee, on the brain, or else draining and lost, always shifting away to unhallowed ground you can't protect, but calling out to the need to be whole, the possibility of celebration even in tough times, and the eye of Shiva, destructive but also compassionate in white and black stone high in the Himalaya. All the questions of identity, origins, and home you have never let yourself ask. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. I'm going to start with uh, a poem called A Kind of Anthem. A Kind of Anthem. A nation you thought you knew, from Ashoka to Buddha to Gandhi to Nehru, in a single decade unravels into Muslim Christian, Hindu, unholy trinity of saffron, green, and blue on a field of British white. My girlfriend's Chinese, my baby mama's a Jew, my husband's red, white, and blue, when we're out on the toot in Chigmagalur, Dew, and Kathmandu, there's no jealousy or rue, we try to eat right. We like our new brew. We float past our differences and accrue credit for the next bardo, our karmic due. Either way, it's true. We're dead if we do and dead if we do. Got a light? Thank you. This is the ghost of Mr. Great Soul. Why, if it isn't Gandhi, returned as a house gecko, talkative, still slender, motionless on the wainscoting, his chirp is plummy British banter. Dear boy, have a deco, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, 
or so you'll find. Mind, one hopes not, and so on and so forth. All I say to him is, what? I don't mean to be rude, but you left us no food. The carving knife you used, like some tiny god, still drips blood on the old floorboard. My extended hopeless family sat down for dinner in India and got up in Pakistan. You turned our house into a granary, the army used for bribes to win over the strongest tribes. 75 is three score and 10 years. Give or take five years. You expect things to change, but what has? Well, we pray to screens and they're still at it, your assassins, in the name of love and fame a people divided by circumcision or not, veils or not, meat or not. Mr. Gecko, Mr. Forget-Me-Not, Mr. Great Soul, you're here and you're not. Thank you. These are all new poems, the uh, first time I'm trying them out. This is called Lateral Violence Among the Model Minorities, and it's set in the US. <clears throat> in the interests of equal opportunity, you propose a toast to the Pakis, Bombole, and remind the Indians their bungies to the British, whose genius was to use the correct insult for each cost, one word, to drive us properly insane. The city, a flicker of phosphenes, flat whispers, segregated flat screens, bifurcated by tongue or tribe or God, and you amongst them, little vampire, walking diatribe, starting fires, prideful of your sodomy, leash gripped between your teeth, Properly insane, you stroll turmeric-stained avenues, stale ambition, sibling cruelties agape in the new world, blurt of righteous chemical, three stories tall, chewy fog of marigold aerosol aimed at babies in the parking lot. Nobody cares for you. You're a cane toad, predative, adaptive, noisy poison eater, satisfied or competitively middle class when ranged among the paralyzed natives, exuberantly noxious yet lovable, the Raja, the Padisha of Roosevelt Avenue. Uh, this is called Let's See Now, F.N. Sousa. Fecking Nickel Sousa. What a feckin' loser. Never met a woman he didn't try to abuse her. But there's a lot of him in this room, isn't there? What's that say about us? We revere good art by bad men and women? Oh, dear. Eric Gill, Rambod, Marina Sitaeva, Anne Sexton, etc., ad infinitum, anon and anon. Why cancel my own pleasure and half my bookshelf for good measure when all I'm doing in truth is shooting myself in the foot? Add Dom Arrays, Nissim Ezekiel, Eunice D'Souza, me and yous, uh. As for F.N. Souza, he may be a loser and a boozer, but he's my loser. Who are you to judge? Pass the fudge. This is called Speak Amnesia. I can't remember why my line breaks this way. In November, I cracked the day to see what might fall out a congealed yellow sky. Mistake became. In December, I saw trees in flame and a bat with a double snout. 
The president likes pain. He's a big guy with a small, strange mushroom for a penis and brain. The colors change. Everywhere is the same. I can't remember when I grew these fins. Was it now or then? Did we sink or swim? Hi, honey. What's your name? This is called February 2020. The climate's in crisis. To breathe is to ache in India. Too cold or too hot, we freeze and bake in India. They police our thoughts, our posts, our clothes, our food. The news and the government is fake in India. Beat the students bloody, then file a case against them. Criminals in power know the laws to break in India. Pick up the innocent and lynch them on a whim. Minorities will be taught how to partake in India. Hamde Kenge, the poet Fez once said, but if you say it, you're anti-national, you have no stake in India. Women and students and poets, they are the enemy. Come here, dear. We'll show you how to shake in India. The economy's bust, jobs are few, the poor are poorer. Question is, how much more can we take in India? When you say your prayers, make sure you pick the right gods. Petitions to the wrong one, you must forsake in India. Jeet, if you don't like it here, Pakistan isn't far away. If you want to stay, shut up. Learn to make in India. And I'll end with a ghazal or a poem about René Ricard. Take your pick. Ghazal. This is called December 2020. 2020 is acuity of vision, a bane of the plague. It's the year we saw clearly the claim of the plague. The poor and the powerless were first to be forgotten and last. How else do you play the game of the plague? The corrupt and the cockroaches always will survive. Home ministers too, oh shame on thee, plague. Mandelstam's joke about Stalin's roach mustache, it got him sent to the gulag, a stain on the plague. Ferreira, Godling, Dawale, Gonzalez, Rout, hounded, imprisoned, driven insane in the plague. Kalita, Narwal, Teltumbre, Wilson, Rao, Bharadwaj, Babu, Sen, Navlaka, say each name to the plague. Where did conscience go in India's new gulag? To the alley to sell itself for fame in the plague. Say nothing, hunker down, mask up, stay safe. No jeet here, just your share of blame in the plague. Thank you very much. I'd like to read from my most recent book of poems, which is called Love Without a Story. One of the books that is part of Westland Amazon that has unfortunately closed down. We just have a few copies left and I hope some of you will be inclined to pick those up at the bookshop. I'd like to start, I'm going to read four poems and I'd like to start with a poem that was actually based on a word that was given to some of us poets by, I think it was the Asian age that actually allocated a word to some of us poets, a word from an Indian language other than English, offered to us by a reader. 
And the word that was allocated to me was mitti, mud. And my initial response was to say no, because I thought I was being asked to write some kind of desh ki dharti poem that I was not comfortable doing. But I'm glad where I stayed with the word. It unfolded into more than I thought it would, uh, into more places than I thought it would lead me to. Mitti. As a child, I ate mud. It tasted of grit and peat and wild churning and something else that I could never quite find a name for. Later, I became a moon gazer, always squinting through windows, believing freedom was aerial, until I figured that the moon was a likely mud gazer, longing for the thick sludge of gravity, the promiscuous thrill of touch, the license to make, to break, to remake. And so I uncovered the old language of poets to be messengers between moon and mud. And I began to uncover the many languages of earth that have nothing to do with nations and atlases and everything to do with the ways of earwigs, the pilgrim trail of roots, the longing of life to hold and be held, and the irrepressible human love of naming, ooze, Maya, manure, humus, dirt, silt, mold, loam, soil, slush, clay, shit, man, matope, baro, tinen, ni, luto, fango, all have their place, I found, in the democracy of tongues, none superior, none untranslatable, all reminders of the anthem of muck of which we are made, except when June clouds capsize over an Arabian sea and a sleeping city awakens to an ache so singular that for just a moment it could have no name other than that where sound meets sense and a slop of matter meets a slick lunatic wetness, mitti. Just that, nothing else will do. There are several poems of travel in this book. Travel to the monastery of La Verna, associated with St. Francis of Assisi in Italy associated with the journey to Ajmer, to the Dargah of Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti. And this particular poem, which is about the journey to that enigmatic granite mountain in the Western Himalayas, Kailash. The monk who's been in silence 16 years, writes me a note at a yak tea stall skirted by ragged prayer flags in a gray hiccuping wind on the road to Kailash. His face is carp and fissure and gleaming teeth. He spends each day cleaning his shrine. It's worth it, he laughs. I clean my shrine, it cleans me. He was a spare parts dealer in a time he barely remembers before he was tripped up by something that felt like a granite mountain in reverse, the deepest pothole he's ever known. Too deep to be called love. That turned him into a spare part himself, utterly 
dispensable, wildly unemployed. And if there is another lifetime, he laughs. This is what I'd ask for. And now he doesn't laugh. Same silence, same cleaning. I don't know how many of you have known this kind of moment, perhaps some of you have. One grows up very often thinking of parents as the backdrop to one's life. It took me a while to actually realize that a parent might be a flesh and blood individual capable of being the foreground of my life. When landscape becomes woman. I was eight when I looked through a keyhole and saw my mother in the drawing room in her hibiscus silk sari, her fingers slender around a glass of iced cola, and I grew suddenly shy for not having seen her before. I knew her well, of course, serene undulation of blue malmal, wrist serrated by thin gold bangle, the gentle convexity of mole on upper right arm and her high arched feet better than I knew myself. And I knew her voice like running water, ice cubes in cola. But through the keyhole at the grown-up party, she was no longer geography. She seemed to know just how to incline her neck just went to sip her swirly drink, and she understood the language of lacquered nails and baritone voices and words like emergency. I could have watched her all night. And that's how I discovered that keyholes always reveal more than doorways, that a chink in the wall is all you need to tumble into a parallel universe. That mothers are women. But I'm going to conclude with a poem that's a playful anthem to all women who are going downhill, who don't do Sudoku, who are losing their memories as far as names and faces are concerned, but doing it all joyfully. Song for catabolic women. We are bound for the ocean and a largesse of sky. We're not looking for the truth or living a lie. We're coming apart, we are going downhill. The fury is almost done, we've had our fill. We are passionate, ironic, angelic, demonic, clairvoyant, rational, wildly Indian, anti-national. We are not trying to make our peace, not looking for a fight. We don't need your shade and we don't need your light. We know charisma isn't contagious and most rules are egregious. We're catabolic women. We've known the refuge of human arms, the comfort of bathroom floors. We've stormed out of rooms. We've thrown open the doors. We figured the tricks to turn rage into celebration. We know why the oldest god dances at every cremation. We've kissed in the rose garden, been the bells of the ball. We've hidden under bed covers and we've stood tall. We're not interested in camouflage or self-revelation, not looking for a bargain or an invitation. We are capable of stillness, even as we gallivant, capable of wisdom, even as we rant. Look into our eyes, you'll see, we are almost through. We can be kind, but we're not really thinking of you. We don't remember names and we don't do Sudoku. We are losing EQ and IQ, forgetting to say please and thank you. We are catabolic women. We've never ticked the right boxes, never filled out the form. Our dharma is tepid. Our politics lukewarm. We've had enough of earnestness and indignation, but still keep the faith in conversation. 
We are wily Easterners enough to argue nirvana and bhakti, talk yin and yang, shiva and shakti. When we are denied a visa, we fall back on astral travel. When samsara gets intense, we simply unravel. We are unbuilding now, unperpetuating, unfortifying, disintegrating. We are caterwauling, catastrophic, shambolic, cataclysmic, catabolic women. Thank you. I'm going to start with a poem called Hangman's Song. A tired man will hang at dawn for hearing voices in his head. Tomorrow's newspapers won't be read and the Republic will sleep peacefully. The Rottweilers have been taken off the leash. They are nosing out children in the dark. Tomorrow's joggers will stumble in the park and the Republic will sleep peacefully. A white crow settles on a branch stripped of its leaves which boys shred. The flayed rain trees will soon be dead and the Republic will sleep peacefully. The lion's open mouth is foaming. His keepers have foraged for flesh all night. They will pile up their plunder at first light and the Republic will sleep peacefully. A man is horsewhipped for bringing the sky into a cold room without after or before. They will nail his shadow to the door and the Republic will sleep peacefully. A man swings like a broken clapper in a bell. The hangman knows all but cannot tell. The Republic must sleep peacefully. Continuing with this sense of ambient insecurity is a poem called Town. In this town, ask for directions in whispers. Tell no one your birth name. Say you're on your way to nightfall. Buy more bread than you'll eat. Read the signboards forwards and back. Mimic the rare songbird hiding in a bush. Stride along the pipeline, bridging the creek. Shuffle off the linen strap on the Kevlar. Play infidel on the hill, believer on the beach. Because one blue is so much closer to us than the other. On your knees in the sand. And when it's time, pray you'll come back. As pearl thread surf, not driftwood in this town. This one's called prayer. Don't ask for the wall of the skin to break, the light blue line of morning to be drawn across your eyelids, the first watchful parrot of the day to ambush you with prayers. Peel, peel back every proverb you were taught to reveal the raw welt of ardor, until you find where the reluctant chronicler wrote, burn and dance, because what is healed is dead. This one's called fire. I never once saw any blood gush out from that marble lion's mouth. Not when a boy fell at the barricades, blinded by buckshot, those faces parked with metal seeds, those faces blurring in nailed eyes. Not when a girl falling on a balcony cried that flames had swallowed her heart. A fire engine drove right past, bells clanging. As you can see, I'm not eminently a, an optimist. Um, this poem's called Dance. It's for um, 
two lovely people who've meant a lot to me over the years, Taib and Sakina Mehta. Uh, Taib was one of our greatest artists. Dance for Taib and Sakina Mehta. Expelled from torched towns, they have dodged the wine of strafing war planes, crossed fields of switchblade grass, stumbled over parched horizons deafened by shells, shrunk to the heirloom skeletons they carry inside their baggy skins under a zinc sky. And now they dance under the same sky that was altar, that is canopy, that could be home, that could be a silk curtain about to fall, a swollen eyelid that could close on their works and days dancing barefoot on shattered glass. They whirl, they sing, they do not fall circling in orbits that spin out and reel back, stir away planets, snared in other people's stories, they not their own. And I'll close with a poem called Lesson. Okay, two more then. Thank you. This one's called Weatherman, and it's set in a part of, part of Delhi that I used to love as a child and which I can't even recognize anymore, Meroli. Weatherman, Meroli. The dome is just an old man's breath, choked briefly in the sun's fist and allowed to go. You don't hear the growl of dogs, the flutter of wings. Last night's rain has shocked this red earth, pooling in the grass, dripping from the Kirini's filigreed branches. Has the mercury fallen, you ask? Is the rain gauge full? Sun or storm, flood or enemy fire, you go out to hold the last gate in the world, the gate of system against error. For the first time, you miss your step among the headstones of Turkish slaves who died, grew large in death, unfurled their sails to become masters of the sky. New clouds call out to be named, but they can wait. For now, let your voice meander, caressing the scrub with green phrases. Here's where you pray, to the locksmith who threw his keys away and married a river that courses beneath traffic. Tar, loam, he surfaces to drape a fabric of pauses on the mottled red sandstone. He'll teach you to listen to angry peacocks, to the anthems ringing in these rubble work walls, to this falcon that's nested in your open notebook. You should leave now or you will never go. That should have been my last line to this patient and marvelous audience, but I'm going to impose one last poem. This one's called Lesson. Uh, set in a period where the powers that be are busy telling us what to do in an exceedingly punitive manner. This poem is dedicated to a fine uh, poet and scholar uh, from Kashmir, Asya Zahur. Lesson for Asya Zahur. The professor warned us not to say a word. He turned to the blackboard and drew a line through our country with his screeching chalk, wrote two names to identify its broken parts. From today, he said, you can forget your flag, leave your spoken language at home. The classroom windows rattled in the wind. He'd forgotten to chain it to the bent willow. The boatman on the lake outside was singing. The professor made a note to abolish him. We won't be needing these walnut screens, he said. I'd like all of you to be completely transparent. When he clapped his hands and blew on them, clouds of chalk dust settled on our desks, burying them for years in snow. Thank you for your attention.